This is uh, the first part in our little series for the next three weeks, Ad Hood, called The God Who. We'll be looking at three different aspects of God, three, three things that make him who he is and what that means for us, his children. And so tonight we're going to see that God knows us, the God who knows us. We'll be looking at Psalm 139. So grab a Bible so that you can follow along. And as you open up to Psalm 139, let me ask you a question. Do you know roughly how many people are living on this planet right now? I actually found a really cool app this week called worldometer.info. And it gives you a, a, a kind of instant uh, a look at what's happening in the world. Uh, at the moment, births today, 229,299, 300, 308,000. Deaths today at the moment, it's just kind of ticking over, 96,279, 83, 84,000. Just keeps on going. Population growth at the moment is 133,076, 80,000. Uh, births this year, 89,000, uh, 270, sorry. Listen properly. 8.9 million. Bit difficult, it's moving. 8.9 million uh, deaths this year, uh, 3.7. Population growth this year, uh, 51 million or so, give or take a few. Uh, it's a very interesting app. Uh, the global population at this point in time is, is somewhere around 7.8 billion, give, give or take a few million maybe. Uh, and, and it's estimated that the total amount of people that have ever lived is, is roughly around 107 billion people, give or take a few. That is a whole lot of people, I'm sure you would agree. Now, it poses many questions for, for us as humanity as, as we continue to grow. Uh, many challenges for us as humanity, but not for God, not at all. According to Psalm 139, every single one of those 7.8 billion people have God's undivided attention. Have a look at verse 1 to 6, Psalm 139. This is what it says. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too, too lofty for me to attain. Take a moment to just let those words sink in. God knows you. He knows everything about you. It says here that God knows all that you do. When you sit and when you rise, when you go out, when you lie down. David is saying here that there is nothing in your life that God does not see and does not know about. When you go to school, when you go out with your friends, when you're sleeping at 3 a.m. in the morning when it's still and dark, God sees and God knows. As you sit there at home right now, God knows how fast your heart is beating, the diameter of the pupils of your eyes, how much oxygen is in your blood at this point in time. He knows exactly what's going on on a molecular level in your entire body. And not just your body, the bodies of the entire population of the world. That's amazing. But it's not only that he sees everything. Verse 2 says, you perceive my thoughts. He, he knows what we're thinking. Now, experts would say that the average mind thinks between 60 and 80,000 thoughts a day. That's about 3,000 thoughts an hour. Multiply that by about 7.8 billion people. God knows every single one of them. Your hopes for the future, your fears and insecurities, how you truly see yourself, he knows it all. Now, at this point, you may be getting a bit nervous. It's almost like we're under 24-7 surveillance, someone watching our every move. I'm sure you've seen those CCTV cameras uh, in like pick and pay or checkers that are, uh, are focused in on the cashiers. And we all know what those are saying, right? Don't make a false move. Don't take any money. Don't do anything that you shouldn't do. Don't do anything dodgy because we're watching you. 
But, but David is actually describing something very different here in Psalm 139. It's more like this. Um, when you have a child for the first time, it's a bit daunting because you have to look after this little one. You've got to keep it alive. It's completely incapable of looking after itself. And so the, the first few months, the baby sleeps right next to mom's bed, sometimes in the bed, just to make sure that he or she's safe. But at some point, believe me, mom and dad need to sleep and they want their baby to sleep through the night. So what do they do? They take the child and they put them in his or her room for the night, which is a very nerve wracking thing to do for the very first time as, as first time parents, because you're thinking to yourself, man, is this child going to pull the covers over their head? Are they going to suffocate? I mean, you hear terrible stories. So what do you do as parents? Well, you get a baby monitor. A little camera you set up with a screen somewhere so you can look over, watch over your baby. That's the kind of picture that David's giving us here in Psalm 139. Not CCTV surveillance, but a baby monitor. Loving care. Parents, a father looking over his children. And you see it as well in, in verse 5. He says, you hem me in, behind and before. Some, some Bibles say hedge instead of hem. What they, what they used to do back in the day, and they still sometimes do, was plant hedges around vineyards or, or properties. And that would keep intruders and thieves out. They were thick, thorny hedges that they would plant. They're not the kind of hedges that you want to try and climb over or, or crawl under. I guess you could think of today's equivalent is those spikes on the top of our walls or maybe even an electric fence. David is saying here that God is his hedge. He protects. Nothing gets through that God doesn't allow. But it's not enough to say God sees everything or God knows everything. You have to go further than that. You have to say God sees you. God knows you personally. As, as humans, we crave intimacy. That's one of the things about being a human. But there's a problem. In order to build intimacy, you, you have to let people see you. You have to be real. You have to let them in. And that can be scary at times. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't necessarily want someone knowing every single thing about me. It's not always good. But God does. God knows everything. And so David knows in the psalm that God sees the wicked in the world too. Those that hate God. Those that are violent, that are bloodthirsty as David describes them. And David hates them. And he wants God to do away with them. But if you keep on reading in that psalm, you also see that David also knows that his heart is not pure. He might not hate God, but he's not perfect. And the difference between David is that he trusts God. And you actually see that in verse 1. I don't know if you spotted it. David refers to God as Lord. And, and in your Bibles, you'll probably see that it's a, a capital, small ca kind of capitals. Now, whenever you see those small capitals, that is the covenant name for God. Maybe you've heard of Yahweh or, or Jehovah. It's a name which represents his relationship with his people. David uses that covenant name for God because he trusts God. And you see, when you trust in Jesus and his work on the cross and his resurrection, God still sees and knows your failings, every single one of them. But he doesn't hold them up and he doesn't accuse us. He doesn't seek to punish us. Because Jesus has been punished in our place. You see, Jesus was the only person who God looked at and saw 100% perfection. Though through him, Jesus, God created the universe. But even so, the second person of the Trinity became man. Came down to earth to be human. You see, he can sympathize with our weakness God doesn't only know and see our weakness. He can sympathize. He knows what it feels like. And Jesus did that so that he could pay for the debt 
of our sins, which we have racked up to the maximum. So God looks at us and sees his children justified, made right, just as if we had never sinned. But with trusting God, and we see this in the psalm, comes repentance as well, which is basically moving away from the old self, the old selfish ways, and becoming more like our Savior Jesus. And trusting and repenting are, are in some ways a package deal. You can't really do one without the other. And so the psalmist, David here, he ends with a prayer. Now, let me warn you, it's actually quite a dangerous prayer. Uh, don't pray this prayer if you're not ready for God to show you what you're asking him. Uh, th this is the prayer. It's in verse 23, right at the end. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You see, God is the God who knows us. We would say that's omniscience. He knows everything. He's all-knowing. And he sees us as we truly are. He knows us actually better than we even know ourselves. And, and so this prayer right at the end with David thinking of God's omniscience is a prayer which invites God to, to find any unbelief in our hearts, any anxiety, and anything in our lives that saddens him and ask God to reveal it to us so, so that he can lead us in eternal, everlasting life. That's what it means to repent. You see, thinking about God and his omniscience, his, his all-knowingness, we can't really just leave it there. And, and, God, and David applies this to himself by asking that, that God would use his all-knowingness to show him parts of his life so that he can repent and be more like his God. And so we should do the same. Let me invite you to do that. I'm going to uh, pray and uh, in line with uh, verse 23 and verse 24. Let's pray together. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Father, we ask that you would show us through the power of your spirit any places where we don't trust you, Father. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to repent of that, Lord. Father, see if there is any offensive way in us and lead us in the way everlasting. Lord, would you continue to change us and make us more like your son, Jesus. We thank you, Father, that you know and see everything, even though that might be daunting, Lord. But we ask that you would use it to make us more like your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.